Okay, it's ready now. Who are all these wonderful women that have Go ahead. been members of this thing? Yeah. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the January uh, Live Poet Society meeting tonight. Glad you everybody can show up. It's January already. And we're glad everybody turned out that could come tonight. And got, got some exciting poetry to read. First one I'm going to read, of course, is out of the book Ride for the Brand, Red Stegall. <coughs> oh, well, keep holding it up a minute. I'm having a problem with the focus in here tonight. The light is not quite as bright as it here as it is in it. Ready? We're ready for you. With this here, I got to thumbing through some pages and got to thinking about a few things. I'm sure a lot of you did the same with your grandmother's items, uh, trunks, or whatever. My grandmother had a trunk. A trunk? A trunk. Big box. Like a cedar chest. Cedar chest. Had a quilt in there and had letters from, you know, my grandfather and, and all assortment of things which we sat there and went through after she had passed and we relived some history okay, of her life and all that. Very interesting. And this one poem made me remember that. And I had I had thought about that in a number of years, but it's called the the memories in grandmother's trunk. They came in a wagon from St. Joe, Missouri. Grandmother was seven years old. I remember she said, and she walked most of the way through the rain, the mud, and the cold. She saw the Comanche. They came into the camp. Not the savage she'd seen in her dreams. They were ragged, pitiful, hungry and cold, begging for salt pork and beans. They staked out a claim at the cross timbers breaks where the big herds went north to the trail. One day a cow puncher gave her a calf. Two young survived on the trail. Their Jersey cow gave more milk than they needed. The calf grew up healthy and strong. She staked him that fall in the grass by the creek and pampered him all winter long. In April, her daddy rode into Fort Worth with her calf on the end of his rope. He traded her prize for a red cedar trunk. That she filled full of memories and hope. I found my grandmother's trunk hidden under a bed in the back room where she used to sleep. I spent the whole morning reliving her youth to the trinkets that she had thought ought to keep. There's the old family Bible, yellow and worn. On the first page was her family tree. She traced it clear back to the New England coast, and the last entry she made was me. I unfolded a beautiful star pattern book. In the corner, she cross-stitched her name. I wonder how many children it kept safe and warm from the cold of the West Texas plains. A tattered old picture that says, Mom, I love you. Though faded, there's a young soldier's face and a medal of honor the government sent when he died in a faraway place. A cradleboard covered with porcupine quills traded for salt pork and beans was lying on top of a ribbon that read Ford Country Rodeo Queen. Dried flowers pressed in a book full of poems, a card with a message in gray to my darling wife on our 25th year, and some old stamps my grandfather had saved. Of course, there are pictures of daddy's folks. They sure did look proper and prim. I reckon if they were to come back to life, we'd look just as funny to them. <laughs> Grandmother's life seemed so simple and slow but the world started changing too soon. She heard the first radio. She saw the first car. 
and live to see men on the moon. Life on this planet is still marching on, and I hope that my grandchildren see my side of life through the trinkets I've saved the way grandmother's like you were talking about. Uh, <clears throat> this is, as you can tell, a rather old book. And it was done many years ago. And it's called The Young America Sings. It's the National High School Poetry Association. It was done here in Texas. These are all written by high school students. And uh, the thing that surprised me today, when I was just flipping through it before Lucy picked me up, if I can find it now, should have marked it. Uh, I had some that were published in here as a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't written since then. But the thing that surprised me the most was, and if we can't find it, I'll just have to tell you. I'll read mine first, then maybe. The first one, at this time I was living out in West Texas, but I had moved there from East Texas as a teenager. And it's supposed to be something about nature. It's called the Lonesome Pine. And Lucy has actually seen this pine tree. Uh, when we were over this place where I used to live in Marshall. There's an enormous pine tree in a land not far away where many came just to see the beauty of its sway. When at night the moon begins to rise, there's beauty to behold as the wind whispers and sighs through its branches streaming with gold. It's so majestic, mighty and tall, the most stately of its kind. But it's really the most lonesome of them all because it's just a beautiful, lonesome pine. I was very lonesome for, for that pine at that time, and I, that was something that I could write about. The two things that I loved when I was growing up, and I still love to this day, and Lucy knows me well enough to know that, is not only the pine trees, but also anything to do with water. And of course, Lucy and I both live on the water across from each other. And out in West Texas, there was very little water. My second poem is called Ripples. <clears throat> Ripples that splash across smooth rocks and rebound with great force, glide gently out into the water and meet with discarded rubbish. They break up, but continue to float until they reach their destiny, the far shore. And we're going through there right now in the lake that we live on, which is kind of... The other one that I found this afternoon, and I couldn't find it just now, and it really surprised me, is written by a student that lived in Kilgore. And it just kind of, when I saw it, everybody has their town in here. And I saw that, I looked over to see who it was, and I was just shocked. Do you know anybody that was famous that lived in Kilgore? Van Cliver. Really? really? Wow. Yeah, so evidently Van Clever and I are the same age, or were the same age. I think it was the same If I can find it, if you all read yours, I'll get up and read it. I thought I, yes, I thought I had it marked, but I didn't. So that was very, thank you. Yay. I was very surprised. Yeah. Yeah, back around there to where the others were standing, so the light will be good enough. Oh, excuse me. Now, what do you want me to do? I want you to stand halfway between the side. Yeah, good. There you go. This is called Advice to Travelers. A borough once sent by express his shipping ticket on his bridle ate up his name and his address. <laughs> And in some warehouse, standing idle, he waited till he'd like to die. The moral hardly needs to show it. Don't keep things locked up deep inside. Say who you are and where you're going. You didn't like it. Sorry, I have a short one. You didn't like it, did you? It's good. I like it. There was another short one in here, which looked like 
Oh. This is called The Builders. I told them a thousand times if I told them once, stop fooling around, I said, with straw and sticks. They won't hold up. You're taking an awful chance. Brick is the stuff to build with. Solid bricks. You want to be impractical? Go ahead. But just remember, I told them, wait and see. You're making a big mistake. All right, I said. But when the wolf comes, don't come running to me. The funny thing is, they didn't. There they sat, one in his crummy yellow shack, and one under his roof of tw twigs, and the wolf ate them, hair and hide. Well, what is done is done, but I've been willing to help them all along. If only they once admitted they were wrong. Oh, how funny. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know who wrote who did this for the connection, but. Okay. So the three little pigs were typical brothers. <laughs> yeah, they're just. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is called apartment house. A filing cabinet of human lives where people swarm like bees in tunnel hives. Each to his own cell in the tower of cone. Identical and frank. We call it. Short yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. The heck with the I'm going to throw on my lawn with the Simple and typical. Oh, here's the good one. Called the toaster. A silver scale with jaws flaming red sits at my elbow and toasts my bread. I hand him fat slices and then, one by one, he hands them back when he sees they are done. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? Be excited! <laughs> Toast for breakfast. You see that, see that creature there? Yeah. I was reading this book of Ernest Hemingway's, and they were uh, his wife, I think it was his third, fourth wife, I don't know, yeah, I've been to And she wanted to have this uh, lion killed for her. She just wanted to have it to hang around. And it was, a, it was a black male lion, and it was absolutely. Gorgeous girl. And so I read that and I, I just kept, kept kind of sorry for the line. Because when I was in Africa, I stood just this far from a whole bunch of lions. I mean, they were all in a little knot and they just all had such a good time. The morning that the world began, the lion growled and growl that man. And I suspect the lion might, if it had been to have tried to bite. I think that's as it ought to be and not as it was taught to me. I think the lion has a right to growl a growl and bite a bite. And if the lion bothered Adam, he should have growled right back home. The way to treat a lion right is growl for growl and bite for bite. True, the lion is better fit for biting than for being fit. Bit. But if you look him in the eye, you'll find the lion is rather shy. He really wants someone to pet him. The trouble is, his teeth won't let us. He has a heart of gold beneath. But the lion just can't trust his teeth. Okay. Uh, what was the title of that last one? The lion. And what was the first one? I didn't get that title. Either. I don't know. I have to go back through all this <laughs> Um, oh, but that's the one about the burrow. Was that the about the burrow? Mm -hmm. All the donkeys. Advice to travelers. Advice. Yeah. yeah. These are great little crazy. I mean, they've got great pictures. That's the neat book. I think I've got it in the second hand store. So were all of those written by the same author? Uh, it looks like most of them might have been. No, I think there's a variety of uh, uh, Okay. So that's a kind of a compendium book you have there. Look at this picture. Anyone you can through here. Looking at some of my classmates and I hadn't thought of years and years and I saw his name and I thought, wow, I don't know. It's called The Void, V-O-I-D. The years ahead, the years behind. Ah, what's the use? You'll get there in time. Just as the sun and moon fight, 
as do rivals for strength of state for revival. So does the moon reign o'er the midnight, and the sun o'er the revenging dawn. And the stars all seek to ignite, to survey the planet's wrong. O life, full of pity and disgrace, look up to this beautiful place to see through the degrading maze of the hatred, disgust, and lays, only surfaced by that lovely living and in service that is life giving. Van Clymer, Freeburn High School, I mean, Kilgore High School. What year? 1950. 50? That's when it was published. Was it around 58 that he won that? Russian competition. Uh, I'm not a fan of Clyburn. I yeah. just happened to see this in here and I thought, that's right, he did come from Kilburn. <laughs> he was not famous then. <laughs> I can assure you. Well, you know, winning that contest catapulted him to just fame that lasted throughout his entire life and still going up. <laughs> that's not a typical poem. Either. Heard from high school I, no. Oh, well, these were the best. Yeah, the best. Some of them that I was reading this afternoon from some of my classes. I forgot their names. Yeah. We were all so young, and some of them, one of them, was written by one of my best friends who died in a car crash when we were going from college that first year in college. And she writes about death. And it just set chills on my mouth. Think about, you know, did she have a premonition of what's going to happen? There's a lot in here that I want to go back and read. I haven't looked at it in a long time. Right. Just All right, boss. Edible yeah. forms. Good title for a book of poetry. It is. Uh, you write that, will you? Yeah. I'm going to read a poem to my late daughter. Oh, yeah. By the way, her daughter, my granddaughter, has just left. After spending a month uh, in the holidays, Sunny, some of you saw her. It's good to see her, yeah. While, you, while she was here. Uh, and we had a good time. And it was a special occasion, right? Where does she live? Yeah. Who? I'm oh, sorry. It was a special occasion. It all, all got together, too, right? Well, yeah, we had a birthday. Birthday! Where does she live? It seemed like it been a year since we had that big class. <laughs> It was exactly. Where does she live in here? Where does she live? Huh? Where does she live? New Zealand. Yeah, right. Yeah. I couldn't hear uh, I'm, I'm going to read a poem tonight uh, about my daughter's, well, one of her poems about men her, the, who were, you know, love life and this sort of thing. Okay. Now, I knew most of the men in her early life, you know, as she got older and moved away and all that. I probably wasn't acquainted with all of them, but she was married twice. Um, the, her, her first marriage ended after uh, a year or so and produced my only grandchild, son. Uh, so uh, and then she married a second time, and apparently, from her points, I'm gathering that you know, she had some other men that she cared about. Uh, and some of her poems, and again, I don't really know whether these poems are about. Uh, actual life experiences or just something that she wrote about. But I think this, toward the end of this book, which is rhythm, rhyme, and reason, stories and poems to bite the heart, right at the very end of it, you know, it's kind of a, almost a little um, anti-climate, the, the actual climax of it is Dream Stuff and None Such, which is the, apparently the name of her. It's a division of Pi Squared, which is how she frequently referred to herself as Pi. Oh, Pi is, you know, the, the, four, four, the mathematical Pi. Right? But it, it really stemmed from when she was a very young girl. I always called her Sweetie Pi. You know, that was yeah. my nickname for her. And she grew up calling herself Pi a lot around the house and leaving off the sweet. The sweet. <laughs> and, and then she evolved it into this Pi Square. Uh, <clears throat> So this book uh, that she published, was apparently under her a division of Pi Squared with the title Dream Stuff and Nonsense, Nonsuch, but the title of the book is Rhythm, Rhyme, and Reason. And 
and just before that, she ends it with this little shorty here that says, you were never so handsome as when you left me, standing in the rain. Goodbye. You were gone. Like angels in antiquity, memories and dust. You know, and that's all there is to that. You know, which I think, from reading some of the other poems about the men in her life, you know, it was may have been a sort of a collaboration, sort of. This may sort of be her summary of, of the men that were in her life. But the one I will read tonight is called Incubus, I N C U B S. He walks my dreams in beauty and supple summer grace. As fair as Grecian statues, hides heartbreak on his face. He looks at me from moonbeams with smiles of falling stars. He shines upon my shipwreck and soothes my sullen scars. He curls up in my seashell, sleeps inside my skin, like lilies does he toil not, yet neither does he spin. He is my only idol, my gilded, jeweled lord. Though he is formed of dream stuff, he is no less adored. I walk my days full blinded, but bright eyed in the night. Then watch inside my eyelids and ride as I ignite. I long to lay my head down upon my cotton sheets and give myself to visions that morning air defeats. I live inside a story that blooms best in the night, wherein he is my glory and moon of my delight. Did she marry you? I don't know who that was referring to. Oh. Uh, I, she did marry two times. <clears throat> to conclude with a paragraph from Edward Hirsch, How to Read a Poem, and Fall in Love with Poetry. In this view, poetry is dangerous. It is allied closely to madness and is not entirely at the dispensation of the poet's conscious will or intellect. Poetry is not like reasoning and power to be exerted according to the determination of the will. Shelley writes in his romantic defense of poetry, a man cannot say, I will compose poetry. The greatest poet even cannot say, for the mind in creation is as fading a coal which some invisible influence, like an inconstant wind, awakens to transitory brightness. And I, I think I would agree with that. I, mean, I don't think that's stretching. Thank you all for coming. Is that all for read some more? I mean, if I, if I, ben Clyburn, Ben Clyburn, did he write a poem or yes. is it about him? No, 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 he wrote it. Oh, okay. it he was in high school. Okay. These are all written by high school students. Let's, uh, let's do that. From, from Kilgore, so I know it's me, Ben Clyburn.